Hey everyone, and welcome to Tech Explained. Today, we're going to get into CISSP Domain 1, Security and Risk Management. If you're studying for the CISSP exam, you're in the right place. This domain is the foundation of everything else in cybersecurity, so getting these concepts down pat is crucial for your success. I know studying for the CISSP can feel overwhelming. There's so much information to absorb, but don't worry. I'm going to break it down slide by slide, give you real-world examples, and share some tips along the way. So let's get started with CISSP Domain 1, Security and Risk Management. This domain makes up about 16% of the exam questions, so it's definitely one you want to master. Think of this domain as the why behind everything we do in cybersecurity. Before we can implement technical controls or design secure systems, we need to understand the fundamental principles of security and how to manage risk effectively. This slide introduces us to the imperative of security governance and risk management. Let me break this down in simple terms. Imagine you're protecting your house. You have limited money and time, right? You can't install every possible security measure. There's just too many. So you have to make smart choices about what to protect and how. That's exactly what organizations face. They have colossal challenges protecting their assets with never unlimited budgets or time. The key insight here is that security isn't just a technical endeavor, it's a strategic business function. Security governance is about directing and controlling the security function to help the business achieve its goals. Think of it this way. Security shouldn't be the department of no, constantly telling the business what they can't do. Instead, security professionals should be enablers, helping the business take calculated risks safely. That's a mindset shift that's crucial for the CISSP exam and for real-world success. Security governance establishes the framework for how an organization's security efforts are managed. It's like the constitution for your security program. It sets the rules and principles that guide everything else. The key point here is that security should be seen not just as a cost center, but as an enabler that increases the value of the organization. When security is done right, it helps the business operate more safely and efficiently rather than just being a roadblock. For example, think about a bank. Strong security doesn't just prevent fraud. It enables customers to trust the bank with their money, which is fundamental to the bank's business model. Without that trust, the bank couldn't operate. So security isn't just a cost. It's actually enabling the core business function. Now let's talk about key principles of governance. This slide covers some crucial principles that will definitely be on your exam. Let's break them down. First, Alignment with business strategy. Security must support and enable business tasks. And instead of just saying no to new initiatives, security professionals should understand the business objectives and help achieve them securely. It's about being a partner, not a police officer. Next, clearly defined roles and responsibilities. Everyone needs to know what they're responsible for when it comes to security. This is where accountability versus responsibility comes in, a key distinction for the exam. Accountability means ownership. You can't delegate accountability. For example, if you're the owner of a house, you're accountable for its security even if you hire a security company. The security company is responsible for implementing security measures, but you're still accountable. Due care and due diligence are another important distinction. Due care is about doing the right things, implementing reasonable security measures. Due diligence is about being able to prove that you're doing the right things, having documentation and processes to show you're exercising due care. This slide shows the hierarchy of security documentation, which is like the legal framework for your security program. Think of it like this. Policies are like laws. They state what people must do. They're high level, and mandatory. Standards are more specific. They're like the building codes that specify exactly how things must be done. For example, a policy might say all systems must have antivirus protection, while a standard would specify all systems must use XYZ antivirus software. Procedures are the step-by-step -step instructions, the how-to guides. If the standard specifies which antivirus to use, the procedure explains exactly how to install and configure it. 
Baselines are the minimum security requirements, like a checklist of security settings that must be applied. Guidelines are recommendations, best practices that are not mandatory but provide guidance. Understanding this hierarchy is crucial for the exam and for implementing security in the real world. Risk management is all about prioritizing your security efforts. You can't protect everything equally, so you need to identify what's most important and focus your resources there. Risk management enables organizations to prioritize their security efforts and allocate resources effectively. It's a systematic process of identifying, assessing, and prioritizing risks, then applying resources to minimize, monitor, and control those risks. Think of it like triage in an emergency room. You can't treat all patients at once, so you prioritize based on severity. Risk management is similar. You prioritize based on which risks pose the greatest threat to the organization. This slide breaks down risk management into three major steps. First, asset valuation. You need to know what you're protecting before you can protect it. This involves assigning value to assets, either quantitatively in monetary terms or qualitatively using rankings like high, medium, low. Next, risk analysis. This is where you identify threats and vulnerabilities. Threats are potential dangers, things that could cause harm. Vulnerabilities are weaknesses that could be exploited by threats. You also assess likelihood, how likely something is to happen, and impact, what the consequences would be if it did happen. Finally, risk treatment. Once you've identified and analyzed risks, you need to decide how to treat them. The options are avoid, eliminate the risk by not doing the activity, transfer, shift the risk to someone else, like buying insurance, mitigate, implement controls to reduce the risk, or accept, consciously decide to accept the risk. Frameworks provide structured approaches to managing risk. There are several frameworks you should know for the exam. NIST-RMF is a seven-step process. Prepare, categorize, select, implement, assess, authorize, and monitor. It's widely used in government agencies and organizations that do business with the government. ISO IEC 27001-27002 are international standards for information security management systems. They provide a risk-based approach and emphasize continual improvement. NIST CSF is built around six core functions, identify, protect, detect, respond, recover, and, added later, govern. It's become very popular in the private sector. COBIT focuses on aligning IT and business strategies, while PCI DSS is specific to payment card security and FedRAMP is for cloud services used by the government. Understanding these frameworks and their key components is essential for the exam. Business Continuity Planning, BCP, is about ensuring that critical business functions can continue during and after a disruption. It's closely related to disaster recovery, but with a key difference. BCP focuses on business processes, while DR focuses on technical recovery. The Business Impact Analysis, BIA, is a crucial part of BCP. It identifies critical systems and services, assesses the impact of disruptions, and helps establish recovery objectives like RTO, recovery time objective, how quickly you need to recover, and RPO, recovery point objective, how much data you can afford to lose. Remember, in any disaster, the priority is always people's safety first. Get people out of harm's way, then worry about IT recovery. Privacy is about protecting personal information, and it's a huge focus area in today's world. Privacy is the state of being free from being observed or disturbed by other people. It's about controlling what personal information others know about you. A privacy policy is essential. It outlines what types of personal data an organization collects, how it's used, stored, and protected. It should also explain opt-out procedures and relevant security policies. Personal data comes in many forms, PII, SPI, PHI, and PI. These can do direct identifiers like name or social security number or indirect identifiers like zip code or age, which can identify someone when combined. 
The data life cycle from creation to destruction is crucial to understand because different controls are needed at each stage. There are numerous privacy laws and regulations you need to be familiar with for the exam. GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, is one of the most stringent privacy laws in the world. It applies to any organization that processes personal data of EU residents regardless of where the organization is located. Key aspects include breach notification within 72 hours, extraterritorial reach, and strong data subject rights like the right to be forgotten. In the U.S., we have CCPA, California Consumer Privacy Act, HIPAA and HITECH for health information, and the Privacy Act of 1974 for federal agencies. Globally, there are many others like PIPETA in Canada, PIPL in China, and POPIA in South Africa. Understanding these laws and their key requirements is essential for the exam and for implementing privacy programs in the real world. Intellectual property, or IP, refers to legal rights granted to creators of intangible assets. There are four main types you need to know. Trade secrets are confidential information that provides a business with a competitive advantage, like the Coca-Cola formula. They're protected as long as they remain secret. Patents provide exclusive ownership of an invention for a set period. To be patentable, an invention must be novel and unique. Copyrights protect the creative expression of ideas, not the ideas themselves, in fixed mediums like books, movies, or software code. Trademarks are symbols, words, or designs that distinguish brands or products like the Nike swoosh or Apple logo. Understanding these different types of IP and how they're protected is important for the exam and for protecting your organization's assets. People are often considered the weakest link in security, but they can also be your greatest asset when properly trained and motivated. Personnel security policies cover the entire employee life cycle, from candidate screening and hiring to onboarding, transfers, and termination. They also include agreements like NDAs and Acceptable Use Policies, or AUPs. Ethics are crucial in security, the ISC2 Code of Professional Ethics is particularly important for CISSP professionals. It comprises four canons, protect society, act honorably, provide diligent service, and advance the profession. Awareness, training, and education are essential for ensuring employees understand their security responsibilities. Awareness is informal and aims to change cultural sensitivity, training provides specific skills, and education teaches fundamental concepts. Organizations must navigate a complex web of laws and regulations. For cybercrimes and data breaches, laws like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, CFAA, and various breach notification laws are important to understand. Key compliance standards and laws include SOX for publicly traded companies, GLBA for financial institutions, FISMA for federal agencies, and many others. Investigations can take different forms, administrative, internal and informal, criminal, involving law enforcement, civil, one entity suing another, industry standards, adherence to specific standards, and regulatory, conducted by regulatory bodies. Understanding these different types of laws and investigations is crucial for the exam and for ensuring your organization stays compliant. As we wrap up, remember that effective security is not a siloed function. It's an integral part of an organization's overall strategy. The emphasis on aligning security with business goals, clearly defining accountability, systematically managing risk, and adhering to ethical and legal obligations is paramount for success. For the CISSP exam, focus on understanding these fundamental concepts and how they interrelate. Domain 1 is the foundation for everything else, so mastering these concepts will help you throughout the exam and in your cybersecurity career. Thanks for joining me for this deep dive into CISSP Domain 1. I hope this walkthrough has helped clarify these important concepts. Remember, the key to passing the CISSP is understanding the why behind security practices, not just memorizing facts. If you found this video helpful, 
please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to Tech Explained for more CISSP content on our channel. Let me know in the comments what topics you'd like me to cover next and share any tips or tricks that helped you with Domain 1. Good luck with your studies. And remember, you've got this.